how about those veterans who have a mixed claim, they have some conditions that are presumptive, some conditions that aren't, but they believe are service-related. How does the VA handle claims like that? Well, basically the VA just separates the claims into two piles, if you will. They take all the ones that are presumptive, and as long as you had service in the right place at the right time, they go ahead and grant service connection, and they rate it, and they pay it. On the ones where they are saying it's not a condition that falls within the presumptions, then it's back to go. You have to show the ordinary three things, the occurrence of the service, the current disability, and a specific medical opinion connecting the one to the other. Welcome to the Victory Over VA podcast. A podcast about empowering veterans to overcome denied disability claims. Each week, we deliver critical insights to help you understand the disability process, veterans' benefits, and how to take control of your legal rights. Now here's your host, Tony Francis Jackson. Welcome to Victory Over VA, your guide to unlocking your VA disability benefits. So, welcome to our podcast, and you probably want to know, who are we? Well, I'm Francis Jackson. This is Christian Terrison. We're at Jackson & McNichol, a law firm that specializes in helping veterans to get justice on their VA disability compensation. We help veterans who've been denied disability to get the benefits they deserve. So who is this show for? Well, obviously it's for veterans, but more than that, it's for those who are concerned about veterans. Families, friends, those in the community who are supporting veterans. It's for everyone who is interested in helping veterans to get the justice they deserve. With that, let's turn to today's topic, which is presumptions. Yes, and presumptive conditions, presumptive service connection, I'm sure that many of our veteran viewers have heard the term before, but can you just explain in a nutshell what is the concept of presumptive service connection and how that might apply to their claims? Sure. So a presumption is just a legal fiction. It means that if certain facts are present, then the law will presume or assume that something else is also true. So in veterans' disability compensation cases, it's necessary ordinarily to prove three things. First, that the veteran has a current medical disability of some sort, whether mental or physical. Second, that there was some illness, event, or other occurrence in service that caused or led to the current disability. And third, a medical opinion showing how what happened in service led to the current disability. What presumptions do is to let you skip over that intermediate step. So in a case with a presumption, you have to show that there's a current disability and you have to show certain facts related to service. But if you show those two things, then the law steps over that third connection, that medical connection, and presumes that there is a medical connection. So just to take a very common example of a presumption, if you served in Vietnam, there is a presumption that you were exposed to Agent Orange. And what that means is that there are certain conditions that we know are associated with exposure to Agent Orange. And if you served in Vietnam or in the waters off Vietnam in the requisite period of time, then the law will presume that if you have some of those service-connected disabilities, sorry, some of those disabilities known to be connected to Agent Orange, diabetes, for example, or lung cancer, if you have those conditions and you served in Vietnam, then the VA will not make you get a doctor's opinion connecting your service in Vietnam and exposure to Agent Orange to the current disease. They will presume that because you served in Vietnam, you were exposed to Agent Orange, and therefore your diabetes is automatically eligible to be connected to service, all you have to do is apply. And as far as the origins of these presumptions within the VA disability framework, did it start with Agent Orange? 
Were those some of the first presumptive conditions? Or? No, they're actually earlier presumptions. Primarily from World War II, there were presumptions that certain prisoners of war were held by the Japanese particularly, but also by the Germans, necessarily contracted things like which people in the United States don't ordinarily encounter as a result of their, their captivity. So presumptions started back with the post-World War II service-connected benefits, but just because of the age of the population, the ones that are most common right now are Vietnam, Agent Orange exposure presumptions, but there is a new collection of presumptions that have come out of the wars in the Middle East over the last 30 years, Afghanistan and Iraq in particular, from what are called burn pits, meaning just huge fires that the military, particularly the army, set to get rid of waste products or damaged equipment or whatever they needed to get rid of. And those throw off, unfortunately, all kinds of carcinogenic and other unhealthy chemicals in the smoke. So people who served in those areas now have a presumption that things like allergic rhinitis are service connected because of the presumption of having been exposed to the smoke from these burn pits. And there's actually quite a list of these conditions, but the most common sets, if you will, are the World War II prisoners of war, the Vietnam presumptions, and the new PACT Act presumptions. Okay. And I guess you mentioned the new PACT Act presumptions. How have the presumptive conditions evolved over the years? Well, the process, if you will, is that Congress asked the National Institutes of Health to look at the question of exposure to Agent Orange and what conditions might medically be determinable to be related to that. And so there are periodic updates from the National Institutes of Health talking about what we have learned in medicine over the years. And one of the things that people complain about is that the presumptions are so slow in evolving, but it's because it takes a long time for the medical science to catch up with the events. So to take Agent Orange and Vietnam as the example, it takes a long time for exposure to dioxin, which is the primary contaminant in Agent Orange, to cause cancer. That's not something that happens overnight. It happens over periods of 30, 40 years. So first you have to have the exposure, obviously. Then you have to have people getting sick. Then you have to have enough people getting sick in the same way that the medical community can say, okay, if you have all these people who served in Vietnam and were exposed to Agent Orange who now have lung cancer, and you have all these people who are roughly the same age and background who do not have lung cancer, then we should look at whether lung cancer is connected to Agent Orange. And the same with diabetes and so on. These things take a long time to rise to the level where they cause symptoms. So the presumptions are always following the medicine, and the medicine, of course, is following the actual exposure. So it's a slow process, but that's essentially how these things evolve. You get the exposure, you get the symptoms, eventually you get enough people with the symptoms, then you get enough aggregate medical evidence that the scientists can say, yep, this is connected to that. Gotcha. And where the presumptions lag behind the diagnoses and the clinical evidence, is there something that veterans can do when they have a condition they suspect is caused by, for instance, Agent Orange or dioxin exposure, but that it isn't enshrined as a presumption yet. What are their options? Well, they actually have pretty good options. The way you deal with that situation is you take the apparent connection. So for a long time, people were saying that stomach cancer might be something that was caused by Agent Orange. Another one is glioblastoma, which is a brain cancer. But those are relatively rare cancers, so it takes a long time for enough volume of evidence to build up to even talk about a presumption for those conditions. But what you can do is you can just make the direct connection that we talked about in the beginning. Remember, you have to have 
some event or occurrence, disease, some, something that happened in service. You have to have a current condition and you have to have a medical link. All the presumption does is to leap over that intermediate medical link. So if you have a condition that is not presumptive, for example, several years ago, we had a lady whose husband died of stomach cancer and she strongly believed that his death was caused by his exposure to Agent Orange in Vietnam leading to the stomach cancer. What we were able to do in that case was to get an oncologist, a specialist in cancer, to look at all the medical records and explain to the VA why it was at least as likely as not that the stomach cancer in this case had been caused by the exposure to Agent Orange. And he was able to do that. You know, we, one of the nice things that we have the opportunity to do is to go out and find experts in these various areas. And so we were able to find an expert who was able to look at the medical records and basically paint the picture for the VA of how the exposure to Agent Orange led to the stomach cancer, which led to this poor gentleman's death, and get his widow a number of years of back benefits. Okay. And in prior episodes, we've talked about the concept of secondary service connection. So those medical conditions that were caused by or have a medical nexus with a service-connected condition. What Can you talk a little bit about the interplay between presumptive conditions and secondary service connection? Sure. Let me just start by talking a little about what secondary service connections are because it will make more sense in that context. Essentially, the VA recognizes that there are times when a medical condition causes other symptoms, and as a result, they consider that secondary to the original condition. One of the conditions that's very common as a presumptive condition in folks who served in Vietnam is diabetes. And one of the secondary conditions that is relatively frequently caused by diabetes is damage to the eyes. And so in diabetes cases, one of the things that we look for in every case is there diabetes-related damage to the eyes. And if so, that's a secondary service connection. And the VA, once you have the medical proof of the condition, will acknowledge that is a symptom caused by the original underlying diabetes, which has now been service-connected, and will recognize that as a service-connected condition and rate it and pay the appropriate level of benefits. Okay. And I guess on a related note, can a presumptive condition ever be denied service connection? And if that is possible, under what circumstances can that happen? This has been fixed by the PACT Act, but what we used to see a lot is service members who served in Southeast Asia, but not in the country of Vietnam, in Thailand or in Cambodia or Laos, where theoretically we didn't have anybody, but they were there. So those folks also got exposed to Agent Orange. However, for a long time, the VA was taking the position that, particularly with the Air Force personnel in Thailand who served at the Royal Thai Air Bases that we used as bases to bomb in Vietnam or to spray Agent Orange or whatever the Air Force was doing from that particular base, they took the position that only certain people at those bases were necessarily exposed to Agent Orange and that other folks who had diabetes, lung cancer, whatever the condition was, even though they had served in Southeast Asia, did not have the right kind of exposure to have presumption to aid them in their claims. And so we had a lot of folks who served in Thailand in particular, a lot of Air Force personnel stationed at the Royal Air Bases, who were denied for what are technically presumptive conditions like diabetes or cancers because the presumption did not extend beyond Vietnam. And it was the same with the folks who served in the Navy off the shores of Vietnam. For a number of years, the VA would not recognize that these folks who served on ships just off the shore had been exposed to Agent Orange just as much as the ones who were on the shore. But that has been since corrected by the Blue Water Navy Act, and those folks now are eligible for the presumptions. But the presumptions are purely statutory, so it's whatever group Congress says 
this presumption applies to and not anybody else. In the PACT Act, for example, they finally went back and extended a presumption of exposure to radiation to folks who were in the service in World War II and in the areas where there was post-World War II atomic bomb testing and various Navy sailors were exposed to the, the radiation from the blasts. But it took, this is a long time later, we're almost mm -hmm. 80 years, and it's only recently that they've enacted the legislation to help those folks be presumptively service-connected. But there are still a few of those folks around, and they get the benefit of the presumption. Mm -hmm. Now, how about those veterans who have a mixed claim? They have some conditions that are presumptive, some conditions that aren't, but they believe are service-related. How does the VA handle claims like that? Well, basically, the VA just separates the claims into two piles, if you will. They take all the ones that are presumptive, and as long as you had service in the right place at the right time, they go ahead and grant service connection, and they rate it, and they pay it. On the ones where they are saying it's not a condition that falls within the presumptions, then it's back to go. You have to show the ordinary three things, the occurrence in the service, the current disability, and a specific medical opinion connecting the one to the other. Okay, so your advice to a veteran who's thinking of applying and they have the, you know, some presumptive conditions, some not, put them all on the Form 526-EZ and send it off to the VA and let them sort it out? Absolutely. There is no reason to hold off non-presumptive conditions simply because you're making a claim for presumptive conditions. The way the VA works, unlike some other disability programs, Social Security Disability Insurance, for example, there's no provision for the VA to grant claims retrospectively. So if there are a couple minor exceptions to that, but they're too rare to talk about. The ordinary rule is that the potential payment of benefits starts the day you file the claim. So if you have both presumptive and non-presumptive claims, you want to file them all just as soon as you can. There's no benefit in waiting to file the non-presumptive claims after you file the presumptive ones. There are a couple things you can do if it's complicated to put the claims together and it's going to take some time to file them. What you can do is file a form with the VA called an intent to file form, which is a very simple form, basically just has your personal information on it and says you intend to make a VA benefits claim. And if you get that right in, then you have up to a year after that to actually fill in the form and submit whatever supportive information you think is needed to go with your claims. But the point is, there's no reason you can't mix presumptive and non-presumptive claims, and there is never a reason to wait in filing claims. Even if you have situations where you know you're going to need to get more information to support your claim, get the claim filed. You can always file the other information to support it at a later point. Okay. Are there any misconceptions, misunderstandings that you hear from veterans surrounding presumptive conditions? <laughs> yes, there are lots of them, but my favorite is, I was exposed to Agent Orange in Vietnam. Why won't the government pay me? Well, the answer usually is because you don't have any service-connected medical condition. The presumptions only go to linking a current disability to service. They don't create a separate disability that doesn't exist. So you always have to start with the medical condition. And if you served in Vietnam, but you're perfectly healthy, you have no medical conditions at all, it doesn't matter that you were exposed to Agent Orange. You're one of the lucky ones who didn't get sick from it, and the VA is not going to pay you simply because you went there and got exposed, as long as it didn't make you sick. Okay. And we're coming up on the end of the episode for today, but just before we finish up, what advice would you offer to veterans or their families who believe they may be eligible for benefits based on a presumptive condition? Well, I give them the same advice that I give people who think they're suffering from a non-presumptive condition, and that is file your claim as quickly as possible. The VA has an obligation, a statutory duty, 
to help you develop the claim once you file it. And they do better about that in some cases than others. But the bottom line is there's never a good reason to wait to file claims. If you have a condition, whether you think it's presumptive or not, get your claim in. And what's going to happen is the VA in anywhere from three to six months, sometimes longer if they have trouble getting certain pieces of information, is going to make a decision on whatever claim or claims you file. And in that decision, they will explain exactly what they have decided and why, so that if they grant your benefits, you'll know what they granted and why. If they deny benefits, they'll tell you this information is missing most of the time. Not always, obviously, but most of the time, what's missing is that medical opinion connecting whatever happened in service to whatever disability you have now. That's the most common thing. Easily 90% of the cases we see fall into that box. So the VA will spell out for you what information you need to proceed with your claim. The part that always makes me really sad is that lots of folks make a claim, they get turned down, and they don't understand that just because the VA turned them down doesn't mean that they shouldn't pursue the claim. I can't tell you how many folks I've had say to me, well, I applied and the VA just turned me down, so I figured I didn't have a valid claim and I stopped. But most of the time, whatever it is that the VA is missing to support your claim can be provided in the appeal process. So if you get denied, appeal the claim, you have, just because of how slowly the system moves, often multiple years to put together the additional information that you need to support the claim. But never just give up if you think you have a valid claim just because you get an initial denial from the VA very large percentage of initial claims get denied and most of them can be granted on appeal if you pursue it and you work with someone who understands the system. All right. Well, thanks very much. This has been a, another episode of Victory Over VA. Please subscribe and tune in next week. Thank you all for looking. Thanks for joining us this week on the Victory Over VA podcast. Make sure to visit our website, veteransbenefits.com slash podcast, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Spotify, or via RSS, so you'll never miss a show. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. If you like this show, you might want to check out our free consultation to see how we can help you with your denied claim. Simply go to veteransbenefits.com and fill out the form. You fought for us. Now let us fight for you. And be sure to tune in next week for our next episode.